also leave um, available. Uh, as Anna said, we are going to record uh, this uh, presentation uh, from now on, and I will also share these slides with you as soon as I finish, because I have here some links that you can check later, and I'll send to my uh, friends at API so they can um, we send it to you later. So welcome to our session today, our webinar about uh, English language teaching inspired by this Reggio Emilia approach. I divided our morning session into these moments uh, today. So first, uh, who are we? Then we have the KW chart. I'll talk briefly about the Reggio Emilia approach and I'll share some practical ideas that I do hope that you can put into practice next week in your lessons as well. Uh, so, just to start, I would like to know, uh, where do you come from in Portugal, the city that you were talking to, if you can type in the chat, and also the ages that you are teaching nowadays. If you maybe, I don't know if you are a private teacher, if you work in a uh, public school or in a pub, uh, private school, if you're having groups of children at home where you teach English, the age that you teach mostly as well. So I can see here people from Setúbal, Santo André, third and fourth graders, which is great. Oh, lots of eight and nine graders. This is great. This is great. This is also the age that I teach here in the Netherlands. Great. Great to see you. that. Thank you very much for sharing. I'll do that very often this webinar. I'll ask some questions and you can type the comments over there. And I think that Sonia, Manu and Anna will also check your questions so we can answer at the end of the session as well. Good, good to know where we are. Yeah, well, nowadays I teach here in the Netherlands. We have uh, 17 public uh, bilingual schools and I teach one of these schools here. I teach groups seven and eight. So my kids are around 10, 11, almost 12 years old. And here I teach uh, English lessons and also IPC. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's international primary curriculum. So some schools, they have this international curriculum where we teach science, philosophy, sociology, math, history, geography in English as well. So the kids here, they have this IPC lessons four times a week. Uh, two lessons in Dutch and two lessons in English with me. But I'll bring you more of this contest um, later on. Good, Cascais. I need to know all these places, guys. <laughs> I have to go to Portugal more often. Really good. Um, okay. So before we move on, before we talk about this KWL chart, and, uh, and before we talk about the Reg Emilia approach, let's talk about our area, which is English language teaching. Um, I started you know, teaching English in 1999, back in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, where I used to live. And I don't know if you can you relate with one of these books. I used to teach business English to some people you know, in some offices uh, on Paulista Avenue in Sao Paulo. And um, I don't know if you already taught uh, adults or if you're still teaching adults, if you work with, with one of these materials in your life. But back in that time, I did all the homework that I was supposed to do. I studied to become an English teacher. Oh, I can see here that we have someone from Brazil here as well, Clay there. there. <laughs> uh, and I did the ICELT from Cambridge. I did, you know, TKT from Cambridge, several teacher training courses to become an English teacher. And, um, you know, when we study to become an English teacher, this is what we have in our courses. Maybe you are familiar with one of these methods. Maybe when you start teaching, you are using more of the reading method. Maybe when you learn English, you, were, you learn already the communicative approach. And maybe uh, when you um, teaching uh, young children, you are using lots of TPR, the total physical response. So when we become English teachers, we are familiar with one of these methods and approaches in order to bring uh, um, the language into our classroom. But one of the things that I found uh, very often in my lessons is that most of the adults, 
that were having English lessons with me, they were saying that they hate learn English. Oh, I hate it. I hate it. I'm just doing that because my boss told me to do, because I have this meeting in China in three months, or because I have to reply some emails in English, but I hate it. I hate it. Said, oh my, but where, you know, all this hate come from? But since when do you hate to learn English? Since when it's boring? And most of them were saying, since I am a child, oh, since I was a child, I don't like to learn this language because it was always boring. Well, back in Brazil, I have always studied in public schools. And in public schools in Brazil, we didn't have, in my time, English language teaching. Nowadays, we have in some schools from kids who are four years old or five, we have lessons once a week in some great uh, public schools. But in my time, we only had English when we were in the fifth grade. So I was around 10. And from 10, from the fifth grade until I go to the middle school, we only had the verb to be. That was the only thing that we were having in our English lessons. Most of translations as well. The teacher was writing lots of texts in English on the board. They gave uh, us a dictionary and we had to translate what it was there. So we were basically writing in Portuguese in our notebooks. So it was boring for me, and, but I didn't know how was it for, you know, um, five years old, seven years old in some schools. So then I start questioning myself, how do children learn English? And especially, how do children learn? Because uh, what was involved when a children has to learn something? So I did my homework again. I did my bachelor in pedagogy. Then I start studying active um, and effective um, learning and teaching English to children. Did my master's in lead professional practice and education to know how children learn and to see if Piaget, Vygotsky, Montessori were bringing some theories that could help me while teaching English to adults. But the thing is that they started falling in love with the universe of becoming an English teacher for children. And I am also, you know, very fan and study a lot of uh, Paulo Freire's uh, critical pedagogy. And I was always questioning myself, why am I doing this? Why do I have to follow the teacher's guide? So this was one of the questions that was in my mind back in that time, more than 20 years ago. And back in that time as well, I also had my daughter, which is Talita. Now she's 22 years old. But when she was four and five, I used to bring her and also her friends from school at home because what I was studying in the university about teaching English to children, oh, let me check with Talita if this is going to work or not. So she was my pilot uh, program at home with her friends and suddenly I started teaching uh, in some schools I was also her teacher in one of her schools as well so every, lots of things started when Talita was also a child just to bring you a little bit of this context for you now let's talk a little bit about the Hedge Media approach uh, before we move on one of the things that I do value in my work is the pedagogy that I school to this pedagogy of listening so before I say something to my students about a topic, I check their previous knowledge. So we do that, maybe you are familiar with this KWL chart. This is what we use in project-based learning as well. Uh, and there are different kinds of KWL chart. This is one that we use in the Netherlands that we, don't, we do not only ask our students, what do you know? What do you want to know? And what do you learn at the end of the process? But we also can ask, what do you know? What do I want to know? How do you find out? What have you learned? What actions will you take? And what new questions do you have about this topic? This is just an example of how KWL charts can be uh, nowadays. But first, I would like that first you could uh, type in the chat, what do you know already about the hedge remedia approach? Do you know anything? Because Anna said, well, I know nothing, and it's okay to know nothing. Do you happen to know anything about this approach? Have you ever followed a course? Have you ever read something about it? Watched the video? I can see Elena and Annabelle saying that, no, nothing. Good. This is good. Yeah, someone is saying that it's from Italy, saying from different grades. 
No, you don't have to say sorry, Anna. Don't worry. It's it's okay to know nothing. <laughs> nothing at all. Hands-on approach from Italy. Sonia is saying, yeah. Okay, someone read something in a Pearson paper. Nothing at all. Okay, so at the end, I can also suggest you some books or some maybe uh, videos that you can watch about it. But I intend to bring here some new ideas for you. Good, exploring teach the kids potential, Fatima is saying. Okay, uh, good, thank you for all your answers. And now I would like to know, considering your uh, contest, what would you like to know about this approach? Is there anything that you are interested? Uh, I know you know nothing about it, but why did you apply to come here to this webinar today? What is your personal interest? What would you like to improve in your lessons? Why, what are you looking for here today? Communication, improving communication. Yeah. Motivation as well, different strategies, okay. Great. Great, great, great answers. Thank you very much. Great, great to know that. Good. Well, the first time that I had to teach a course about the Reggio Media approach, I spent uh, 16 hours. It was uh, two Saturdays that we were starting this project back in Brazil. And I'll try to answer most of your questions here today in one hour. I do, I will, I'll try to do my best. Learning new ideas, children's abilities, great. We will try to, to figure it out. Okay, so just to start, the Reggio Media, it's, uh, you know, when, it's a city in the north of Italy. This is the train station of this city, okay? It's a small city. Well, I come from Sao Paulo, Brazil, so 17 million people. So whenever I see a city with, you know, 17, uh, 170,000, for me, it's quite small. But it's this city located in the north of Italy between Bologna and Milan. So if you wanna go there once, you can get your plane to Milan and then you get a train and then you two hours, you are in graduate media. Um, when did this approach start to become famous? Or oh, how, how, did, how did it start? Back in 1991, this magazine, Newsweek, made uh, this uh, article about what are the best, the best 10 schools around the whole world. What is the best school to teach math? What is the best school to teach geography? Where is the best kindergarten in the whole world? And they spot Reggio Media in Italy. Better saying this is school called Diana, and it's Anido uh, in Italy. And they, they, they discovered that there they could find the best kindergarten for children. And after this day, after this magazine, all the educators from all over the world are going to Reggio Media to check what is the special in this Diana school, what's the special in this uh, approach. Claydere here is saying that it's going to be their next destination. This is good. Reggio Media is a good place to be as well. So just to bring you how did this approach start and why did it became famous and what are the differences of this approach with the others that we may have in our schools. So just to start, in 1946, right after the Second World War, in the village of Villa Cella, workers and merchants who had lost everything joined the new residents who settled there in order to build a school for young children. So it was a movement that was started by people in that city. The school was built with the sale of a war tank, six horses, and three trucks left by the Germans. This initial movement involved the entire community, but especially the parents, as they had a desire to rebuild their own history and the possibility of a better life for their children. So since the beginning, region schools are rooted in the desire of families to build a better world through education. 
this was the first school that was built in Brasilia. In that time, it was called uh, Asilo del Popolo. And uh, after some time, they changed this for the Vinta Cinque Aprile, as they say there. And here on this board of this school, that it's still there nowadays, you will find that men and women together, they have built the walls of this school because they wanted new and different for their children. So it was a movement that started by the parents. And it involved lots of educators from the area, Loris Malaguzzi, who was passing by with his bike saying, what are you doing here? Oh, we are building a school, but we are all parents. We need help. Do you know any educators? And Loris Malaguzzi was, you know, working with a Montessori approach, uh, approach in Rome. So they started working together and he helped uh, these parents and all this community to um, build the, the foundation for this approach to happen. Um, if you go for in graduate media, you will find that they have a center uh, with for research. You, you can go there any time of the year. And uh, it's this center is organized by an organization called the Reggio Children. Okay. Yeah, that is the National Day of Italy. That's true. Uh, Ontario is saying here. So if you go to um, the website of the graduate media approach, how do they define this approach? They say that the graduate media approach is an educational philosophy based on the image of a child with strong potentialities for development and a subject with rights, who learns through the hundred languages belonging to all human beings and grows in relations with others. So this is a theory. How does it mean? What, what does it mean? So how do we have that in the practice of our schools? They also have some principles for this approach to take place. That is this one. They say that the Reggio Emilio approach is founded on the collegial and relation based work for all workers, the daily presence of a plurality of educators and teachers with children, the atelier and the person of the atelierista, the kitchens of the school, the environment as the educator, documentation for making creative knowledge process feasible, the pedagogical education uh, coordinating with a group family and participation with everyone. This is a theory. So then you read this, okay, but what does it mean? What do I do with that? Don't worry that we will uh, get that in our English lessons as well. And also when you start reading about this approach, you will find a book called The Hundred Languages of Children. And this is like the first book that you should read if you want to know more about this approach. They have it in different languages, in Portuguese, Spanish, Greek, uh, Italian, and everything. Uh, but The Hundred Languages of Children is also a poem that was written by Loris Malaguzzi. I have here just a short part of this poem, then I'm going to read it to you. He says that uh, the child is made of 100, the child has 100 languages, 100 hands, 100 thoughts, and 100 ways of thinking, of playing, of speaking. I will base uh, the, my, my, material, my material today to share with you just on this part of this poem, okay? So how, how did this poem, this part of this poem change it the way that I was teaching English to my students back in Brazil in that time, and then in Kenya and Italy, and also here in the Netherlands as well. So now let's go to the, our favorite part, which is the practical ideas. First, expectations versus reality. When you go to Reggio Emilia, and then you see there, a, a group of 17 children working with three different teachers. And it's like, uh, but it's a teacher and two helpers, an assistant, a trainee. No, there are 17 kids with three different teachers over there. And I said, well, okay. So back in Brazil, we have sometimes 45, 52 kids in a group with one teacher alone. How can we be inspired by an approach that works in a fairy tale mode. How can we do that? But then I started, you know, uh, trying to adapt some of the ideas that I was learning uh, back in Reggio Emilia and bring these ideas to my lessons in Brazil. Uh, I started learning about this approach in 2008 uh, in a study group uh, at school. And I was um, following several meetings and everything. 
And then back in 2011, I had my first uh, trip to Reggio Emilia to know some schools, to talk with teachers, with families over there. And I, I work closely with the UNIMOR, that it's the uh, University of Reggio Emilia and Modena, with the Professor Nicola Barbieri, who's my great, great friend, and who has been helping me a lot to spread the Reggio Emilia approach in my context back in Kenya, Brazil, and here in the Netherlands. So whenever uh, I was invited in Brazil to teach something about my discoveries in Reggio Emilia, he was the one providing me guidance uh, and also the theory material to share with teachers back in Brazil. So this is what we started doing back in 2016, uh, sharing some knowledges with Brazilian teachers. Um, and back in, in 2017, I had a chance to share what I was learning with these teachers in a seminar in the university as well. And that was me relieved after the uh, seminar that it was delivered in Italian for all the teachers from the Reggio Emilia schools, the specialists from the Reggio children as well. So we have been together ever since. This is Professor Nicola Barbieri. Uh, he's also um, uh, Paulo, the other friend from school. So when we are together, we have lessons about Paulo Freire, about the educational emergencies in Brazil, the hundred languages of educators. We try to um, keep this report even uh, nowadays, despite the distance and everything. So when I, I have been teaching English for more than 20 years now, and I always listen to in several webinars. You have to think out of the box. You have to do things out of the box. And then I start wondering, but what's inside the box? And I discovered that when people say, think out of the box and then that they were thinking, they were talking about this. So, okay, in our bubble of ELT, of English language teaching, we are learning these theories. But what's outside our bubble? What's outside our box? And that is the Reggio Emilia that I discovered uh, in my career. So for example, when I started teaching kids, the third thing that I was questioning myself was, who are these kids that I am teaching? Where do they come from? What do they like? So I start questioning myself, how well do I know my students? And how often do I take into account their interests before and during a lesson? So what did I start doing? Then going to the practical part, I started asking my students. So if I say that the, one of the rules of my work is this pedagogy of listening, the pedagogy da escuta, why not asking my children what do they like? So I started every lesson giving them this piece of paper. Can you please write here or draw? Because if the kids are four or five years old, they cannot write yet. So can you please write here? What do you like? So they were writing things like, I like Minecraft, I like Electronic Day, I like Mamãe, Pokemon, Fandangos, and it's some sweet, uh, sweets that we have in Brazil, and Michael Jackson. Okay, so how do I get their interest into my English lesson? How can I bring Minecraft? How can I bring Michael Jackson? How can I bring Electronic Day into my lessons as well? And you know, several examples here. So we have here Elvis Presley, Ozzy Osbourne, Rock, uh, Coldplay, Star Wars. So uh, my challenge was how can I uh, bring their interests into my lessons and make it pleasant, pleasant for everybody as well. But also I was questioning how well do they know me? Do they know anything about Talita, my daughter? Do they know that my favorite fruit is passion fruit, our delicious maracujá? Do they know that my favorite uh, Italian singer is Giovanotti? Do they know I cannot swim yet? So how well do they know me? How often do I share something about me in my lessons? So I started changing the way that I was also communicating with my students uh, in the classroom. When we learn about the Reggio Emilia approach, we learn something about this third educator. What is this third educator? Loris Malaguzzi used to say that there are three teachers of children, the adults, the other children, and their physical environment. 
So the environment is the third teacher. And that was the first thing that I was looking for in the Reg Familia approach. My first research question was, how can I, as an English teacher, uh, oh, I can see that here, Marta was not, uh, is only Marta having problems with listening? Can you all listen to me? Let me see if I can change that. Make it louder. Okay, you I can. I think so, Sandra. I think it's only Marta uh, okay. and already suggested to leave the room and get in again. Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> thank you. So my research question was, how can I, uh, you know, as an English teacher, organize this? What is this third educator? So if the children have to learn with me, the teacher, the other children and the environment, how can I organize their classroom in a way that they can learn from the walls, from what I have on the roof, under the table, or at the door. But at that time, I didn't have uh, my own English classroom. Like, even nowadays, I don't have it. I don't know if you have this, if you can say that you have your own English classroom in your school, or if you only have a wall, if you only have the, do the bathroom's door. That was, they gave me once in a school. Oh, you can do something in the toilet store. That, okay, I'll start there. And then I got a wall uh, in the corridor of our schools. And I can see that Elena is also saying that we usually, yeah, we don't have English classrooms as well. So it's um, um, not, uh, not something that we, only I was struggling. So how can we as English teachers uh, reorganize a wall or have some kind of English corner where we are teaching? So our students can learn in that space, uh, even when we are not there. This is the question. How can they learn with the environment? So I was also organizing some moments in the schools like this. What a, what a, why not? I can have a circle time like this. So, and also this one. So since I didn't have an English classroom, they gave me this wall that when children, it was right in the entrance of this, the, this school. And what you can see there, every, every song that I was teaching my students, you can see on this wall. So maybe you are familiar with this bingo one. There was a farm, they had a dog and bingo was his name, B-I-N-G-O. So every song that we had, we had it in this wall the ABC rock, the Macarena with the months of the year. Uh, I also had there any game suggestion, any music suggestion, any movie suggestion. So kids were always welcome to say whatever they wanted in our lessons, to put it over there and I would check every now and then. And the magical is that this picture was not taken by me. It was taken by the coordinator of the school in a day that I wasn't there. I was, I used to teach in this school on Mondays and Wednesdays. And this photo was taken on Friday because she was saying, Sandra, you are not here today, but you are here all the time. Because the kids were learning with the environment. Whenever they were there, they were reading with their finger. You now when you do that, read with your finger. So they were trying to sing the songs. And also I re just remember something of the cookie jar. That I, I would I would also saw over there. I'm just right here that I cannot forget. So there. Um, I don't know if you are also familiar with this song that it's the Macarena months of the year. I can leave the link here for you. It's wonderful. Kids love to sing it. Um, and it's pretty basic. But if you can see here, it's a child maze material. What is a child-based material? It's a material that it was made by children, for children, and with children. I know that sometimes with, you know, with all the best interests in our heart, we tend to, at the beginning of a new school year, to, oh, let me do this poster of the song. Let me print this. Let me laminate this. Uh, let me organize the helper's calendar or the calendar of events of our school. But why we cannot wait for our students so we can do this together? Why we cannot have their routines? Everything that we have displayed in our classroom made with by our students. Because what happens is that 
when they have the chance to do that, they feel they belong to that place. It's not something that we bought online. It's not something that the teacher made on the weekend. Go enjoy your wine, go to the movies, enjoy your family. Try to save, to, to, uh, to organize more time to do this with your students in the classroom. Um, what about pedagogical documentation and visible learning? In this approach of Retro Media, they advise teachers to organize um, all the learning process of students in the pedagogical documentation. How can we help students to see what they have been learning in when we started our new year in September, then in February, check again, and then the end in June. How can they check what they are learning or not? Or maybe we, they can also do that through years and years and years. So for those of you who teach the early years, do you happen to know which song is this one? If you teach maybe five, six, and seven years old, maybe you know this song? Five Little Monkeys, yes. So we have this song that is called Five Little Monkeys Jumping on the Bed. Yeah, every, lots of people know this one here. So when Juliana was five years old, she was uh, you know, trying to illustrate the song with this five little monkeys that she draw over there that you can see there. When Juliana was in the second grade with me, because what I did, sometimes when we have this material, we send it home. But sometimes I keep some of materials with me because when Juliana was in the second grade, she could do a fill in the blanks of five little monkeys. But she didn't start from zero. She started from the same activity that she started when she was five years old. So maybe you can take, Sandra, I don't have a space for this. How am I going to save the materials of my students? Maybe you can take a photo. Maybe you can save it in your cloud. So the student can see that it's not, they are not starting from zero. They already saw it before. So when we start teaching, for example, family members to our students, we don't say uncle or nephew. We start with mom, dad, brother, sister, baby brother, baby sister. And then after some months, or maybe after a year, we introduce uncle, niece, nephew, grandpa. But how do we register this? How can we show this student? How can we show their family? Look, one year ago or three months ago, you learned these three words, mom, dad, brother, and sister, four. After some time, uh, niece, nephew, uncle, and then we start showing them how they are improving. We know it. I know that what I'm saying, it may sound sometimes obvious for you, but it's not visible for the students. And this is what I say when I talk about visible learning. We know the process. We are the teachers. But how can we make this process visible for the child, for their families as well? So this is an example of an activity in the second grade. But also we had one because... And did you see here how Leah was riding monkey? Mon Leah here was seven years old. And here you can see that Juliana, she had to write a lot about the song, but the other is student to know. So we start, you know, differentiating here what they can do or not. Uh, what about the hundred languages of children that we have a lot in this approach? My question was, how often do I make room for the hundred ways of thinking, playing, and speaking of my students? So whenever I was planning their lesson, I was wondering about this. And I know that, you know, when I started teaching English 20, more than 20 years ago, I used to follow the teacher's guide. And when we don't have experience, we follow every single step, like say good morning to your students, ask them to open the book on page 17, greet them this, do this, do that. We follow that just like as a Bible sometimes. But after some years of experience, we say, you know, I can do it in a different way. I don't have to do everything that we have there. And depending of, on the level of autonomy that you have in your school, you can also say to families, oh, but we bought the book, we want you to use everything. Wait a second. The page 17 of the book is saying that I have to work with the present continuous. We will learn, 
they your your child is going to learn the present continuous. But not only doing this exercise, we can also do something extra. So you probably can relate with activities like this when we are teaching, you know, clothes for our students. They go on Pinterest, you go to Google Images and you do things like that. It's okay, we can do that sometimes, but we can also innovate. Why we cannot have the vocabulary clothes like this? And this is what we do a lot in the Reg Media approach. We don't do, we don't have printed images of anything. It's always a blank paper. So why I cannot give them a blank paper with some crayons, with some pieces of cloth? And so you decide, are you going to draw a boy, a girl, a dinosaur? It's your choice. Give them. We always say, oh, student's voice is this, student's voice there. How can we put this into practice? They decide if they're going to make a dress, if they're going to make a t-shirt, a skirt, socks. They have more autonomy to choose. That's why I chose this image also to start our lesson uh, today. Oh, we can also ask them to sometimes, oh, design your own t-shirt the way you like. Or we can also ask them to go to a place where we can have some sand, give them this magical stick that they love it, and dictation. I want you to draw a t-shirt. Okay, now erase. Now I want you to draw socks. And they can do it in a different way. The Red Rebuild approach also work, works with lots of uh, materials from the nature as well. So we go outside a lot with the kids. Uh, that's why they say sometimes that ci hanno fregato da piccoli quando ci hanno insegnato a colorare a dentro imagine, that we say in Portuguese que nos enganaram quando éramos crianças e nos pediram para colorir sempre dentro das margens. Why do we have to ask kids to do that all the time? Why don't we need them? We can let them to be more free in their activities. And when I was searching once, for example, parts of the body, vocabulary activity, and if I go on Google and I see these images, I think, oh, wait, what about the black children? What is the reference that we have in our workbooks or in the worksheet that we have, we give to our students? It's only one kind of skin color. What are we doing? So instead of doing this, why we cannot do that? So we can ask kids to bring this material. Oh, if you're going to a park this weekend and you find any leaves on the sidewalk, any place, put this into this special bag, bring it to the classroom, we are going to use this. And here we have, you know, shoes, legs, shorts, t-shirt, arms, hair, eyes, nose, mouth, made by the kids. So why we cannot have more inclusive activities like these as well. Or sometimes we have in our schools, lots of games with some stereotyped images of animals, of fruits, of people. And yeah, this is cute, this is nice, but they don't deserve to have an image of a real tiger or a real lion sometimes. And it's okay that we can use this material sometimes, but what if they could build their own material? So most of the schools, they are uh, inspired by Dewey, who used to say that education is not preparation for life, education is life itself. But we have this meme that we use in Portuguese, that uh, a escola prepara a pessoa para a vida, and then we have this kind of caterpillar, but in real life, it's that one. So... How much of this real life, you know, inspired by Dewey, are we bringing to our lessons or not? So if the uh, education is life itself, why cannot bring, you know, the real images of five little monkeys lying or jumping on the bed? Why do we have to bring these stereotyped images all the time when we talk about teaching uh, anything, not only English to only, uh, young children? So how often do I make room for the hundred ways of thinking, playing and speaking of my students, why they cannot have their own memory game? So, you know, if I have to use a stereotype image, I'm not going to buy it, I'll, I'll ask them to do it. So this Sophia, uh, this girl, she wrote 
tiger, monkey, elephant, snake, turtle, crocodile. And then you say, Sandra, no, this is all wrong. We cannot ask our students to write snake like this or crocodile like this. We, she, Sophia is only six, you know, she will learn how to write turtle in the future. But it's nice for her to see that in August 5, she was writing turtle like this, but maybe in three months or maybe next year, she'll be writing in a different way. We have to show them this process and they love when they can do the memory game by themselves, when they cut and then they are going to open, oh, this is my tiger, oh, this is your monkey. So ask them to do this and then you can laminate this. So instead of printing things from Google images or print or Pinterest, ask your students to, you know, to do their own memory game. Uh, or tongue twisters for fifth graders. We have this challenge in the school. Uh, so instead of me researching lots of tongue twisters that are suitable for my fifth graders, no, they can do that. I can give them a Chromebook. They can search it at home and they can bring theirs. They can illustrate by themselves. And then we do the challenge in the school. So more child-based material in our lessons. It would be very uh, uh, aligned with this graduate media approach as well. As five little monkeys here. So they started building the bed and they do the monkey in a different way. Or when they can say, oh, what is happiness? And they, every single day, they have a different answer. Mm -hmm. So why not? Staying with my family or playing with friends when everybody is together. And then we have here displayed in our classroom. So more student voice as well. The alphabet. Sometimes I go to schools all over Brazil, go to schools uh, in Italy, in Spain, also here in the Netherlands. And apparently we have the same alphabet in all these schools. But why can't we have in our walls a little bit about the culture, about the hands of our students, even in the ABC, even displayed on the numbers that we have in our classroom? Why can't we have more time you know, so we can build this kind of material with our students. This one, when they said at the beginning, oh, we like Minecraft. So after reading this book, that it's called my first book of girl power, we read this book on the uh, 8th of March, that it's the National Women's Day. And then they had this challenge of, um, you know, you learn something about uh, Annie Frank, Malala, Marie Curie, and... Um, Cleopatra, now you can make a project about these women that you want to know more about it. So they could do, for example, a puppet, uh, a finger puppet uh, play about this. But this girl, she decided to do on Minecraft, uh, the house of Annie Frank, where she had to hide with her family in Amsterdam. And she did that on Minecraft and explaining in English everything that she was able to do in our English lessons as well. And also when I go to the schools in Kenya, so try to bring, you know, most lots of um, uh, child-based experiences for teachers and for the kids then as well. So again, this is the question that I'm going to repeat over and over today. How often can we make room for the hundred ways of playing and speaking of your students? Here in the Netherlands, I have in my school, uh, 17 different languages in my group eight, for example. So I have students who speak uh, Spanish, uh, Turkish, Moroccan, different kinds of Arabic, Farsi and everything. So whenever they have to do a mind map in our English lessons or IPC English lessons, they can also use uh, their mother tongue. Why not? Multilingualism is always welcome. So here he's, he can say flood, but inundacion, and then he say no electricity, drowning, and sometimes he mixes words in Dutch as well, and this is fine. When he says well, water's drop here, for example, damen, it's welcome. I think it's this is okay to use it. Also in the, as I say, as I, um, Anna told you at the beginning, I also uh, have a project here with Team Up, UNICEF and Save the Children, uh, with children who live in a refugee center here in the Netherlands. 
And yeah, we, here we speak the language of play. I do not speak uh, Dutch language yet. In this case, when they come, they only speak their mother tongue. So most of them, they come from Afghanistan, from Syria, from Iraq, uh, Iran, uh, and then they know Arabic, they know Farsi, they know, they know different languages. So they come, what do we do? We try to bring, when we have to end up a session, we do like a popcorn that we do this like this, uh, one, two, three, and then we'll clap. But we can also do that in different languages, like um, dois, tres. Oh, this is Portuguese because Sandra speaks Portuguese. They say that with their body language. You know, and then we do that in different languages as well. Um, but then, since we are talking about the, the languages of children, but what happens to our own languages when we become adults? How? So the thing is that we tend to teach in the way we were taught. So if we could, if we keep delivering the same teacher training with this um, format, with this mindset we will keep doing the same things in the classroom so that's what's one of my ideas for our next convention in may in braga this year that i will change this setting for my session we will not deliver a teacher training like this we will do different things because we need to do different in the classroom but if we follow teacher trainings only like this we will keep doing the same. We will keep having the same results in the classroom. So why we cannot have a teacher training in a different way? As I said, I'm very much inspired by the Paulo Freire's uh, uh, theory. And he used to say that whoever teaches learns in the act of teaching and whoever learns teaches in the act of learning. And I have the pleasure to be working for the last uh, uh, 10 years with one of his daughter, which is Fatima Freire. And Fatima Freire, she has a book uh, that I also uh, gave uh, one, a copy for Sonia the last time we've met. She has an amazing, amazing, amazing book called Quem Educa Marca o Corpo do Outro. And Fatima says in her book that the challenge of the educator who is alive and open to the world is to always keep his or her inner child alive so that he or she can continue to learn to look at the world things, people and animals as children look. So we tend to teach in the way we were taught. That's why when I can have the chance to provide a face-to-face -face teacher training, what I like to do with my teachers. And here you can say, oh, but this is only kindergarten teachers. No, here we have middle school teachers, chemistry teachers, history teachers, working, uh, learning together in a different way. English teachers learning, learning here how to tell stories with different materials. And then after I received these photos of my Instagram account, there was this chemistry teacher that she had to teach about neutrons, protons, and electrons. And she started doing this with her students. So if she can do that, you know, in the middle school, in a chemistry lesson, why can't we have these in our English lessons as well? Also in Kenya, we are changing the way to deliver teacher training there. And if you are interested to go to Kenya in our next uh, teacher volunteering trip, the next one is going to be 2025. You can write me and I'll give you all the information uh, later on. We had an amazing team of Brazilian teachers going this year. And I would try to organize this uh, teacher's trip every two years to Kenya. So you have the chance to teach the kids over there, but also to teach the teachers there and to learn from them as well. Uh, also here in the Netherlands, I can I provide uh, training for the refugee people who arrive here. But before I talk about the Dutch culture, I talk about their culture, I talk about their mother tongue. So we start every session asking them, what is your favorite word in your mother tongue? And this is what they write. And of course, that I cannot read it later. We discussed this in the session, but I cannot read it later. So, you no, know, try to provide the different ways people express themselves. So this is the idea that I was trying to bring up for you today. I hope that I, I will have some minutes now for uh, questions. 
I don't know if you want to know something else about the Reggio Emilia approach, but just a, a final thought that I would like to share uh, with you is that um, try to think about this, that we tend to teach in the way we were taught. So try to look for teacher trainings to experiences that it's going to, to, to take you out of your comfort zone. Sometimes you can do a, um, a training about um, photographs, about uh, uh, cooking a different meal, or even about uh, building uh, different musical instruments into your lesson. You know, the more we, we, we leave our comfort zone, the more we will feel in, in the role of our students as well. Uh, Again, when Malaguzzi used to share his thoughts about the hundred languages of children, I always try to, um, I can see here that Teresa is saying that I relate and feel a little embarrassed here, yeah. but that's how our students feel. They feel embarrassed most of the time because they are new to this language as well. And uh, whenever we think about the hundred languages of our students, of our hundred languages, and I think about this poem, I think about this image. And then maybe we'll see, oh my, Sandra, how can you be so cruel? This has nothing to do with the hundred languages of children. Look what this teacher is doing. And then I was so impacted by this image once that I shared that with my second grader students in Brazil, showing, look, uh, this is what happens. Then what do you think? You know, when you do this exercise, what do you see? What do you think? And what do you wonder? Okay, so look at this image. What do you see? What do you think? And what do you wonder? Does it happen with you? Does it happen in our school? Does it happen in my lessons? What happens in our lessons? And then I had to ask my students to draw what happens in our lessons. And because, you know, me as a child, I had to be a different me as a teacher as well. So then Carol, one of my students, she made this one. That according to her, this is what was happening in our lessons. Luana did this one that the teacher, she and her friends were thinking hearts, but Enzo was thinking in a different way. And Manu, she made this one, that according to her, the students, they all have different languages, different opinions, and the teacher is there trying to uh, have all of them. And I love this image so much that I even made like a t-shirt for Manu and for me of this one, that it's the one that I'm wearing today. I don't know if you can see it. I will show you the images later, but... Uh, you know, when you think about the hundred languages of children, this is the best present that I could have from someone. So I'm going to leave here my um, my social media, my email. You can always keep in touch. I'll stop sharing my screen right now because I want to listen. I, I, I will check here if we have more um, questions about this approach. Yeah, we still have four minutes. Okay, so just let me just stop sharing this. Then I, I can show oh. my people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much. It was a very interesting, enlightening session about Radio Emilia approach but also thank you for sharing your teaching experience and uh, your children's artworks materials uh, created by them um, I don't know if someone has uh, a question well I don't think they have written anything in the chat box um, in the chat box Annabella is saying something about her experience in Germany in a Waldorf kindergarten uh, that it was, uh, it was really, the Reggio Emilia approach is also inspired by the Waldorf oh, pedagogy, Montessori's studies as well, Paulo Freire. So they, when we talk about the Reggio Emilia approach, you can, also, you can also see little bits of Montessori, Freire, and Waldorf pedagogy as well. Thank well, you for being, Annabella. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Sandra. Uh, and as Sandra said, we can we will have the opportunity to attend another uh, session in Braga on the 10th, 11th, and 12th of May uh, in the, the 37 Apiano Conference. 
Um, just a quick reminder also that we are going to have another face-to-face -face, uh, seminar in February in Vila Nova de Santo André, Alentejo. Uh, the program is already available. We have a really interesting lineup of speakers.